Hello and welcome to New Central Now. I'm Darshan Usman. The top stories. House of Representatives holds implementation of cyber security levy. Former Nigeria's aviation minister Hadi Sirika granted bail over alleged 2.5 billion Naira fraud. 11 injured as Boeing plane skids off runway in Senegal. Details of these stories and more in a moment. We begin in Nigeria's Niger Delta, where Governor Siminalai Fubara on Thursday stormed the River State House of Assembly quarters amid the political crisis rocking the state. There was tight security around the area as the River State Governor visited the quarters where the Martin Amaule led legislators meet. The governor said he was at the place as the governor of the state as he took a three-minute walk around the premises before leaving. His visit came on the heels of a fresh crisis in the River State House of Assembly. As some lawmakers loyal to the governor had on Wednesday elected the member representing the Boni constituency, Victor Okojombo, as their speaker. Joining me on the news to discuss this further is a lawyer from River State, Eugene Ode. Hello, Eugene. Thank you so much for joining me at this time. Hello, Thank Eugene. you for having me. My pleasure. It's a, any time. It's a pleasure. All right. Uh, considering the circumstances surrounding the election of Victor Kojomba as Speaker, what avenues are available for verifying the legitimacy of his appointment and also addressing any concerns regarding the validity of the process? Now, um, don't forget that the House of Assembly of the States River State House of Assembly is a creation of the Constitution. And the Constitution itself also provides the modus operandi of the House of Assembly. The House of Assembly is created principally to make laws for good governance. You know, and you will agree with me that the crisis that have brought the River State House of Assembly has thrown so much have a lot to be desired. From October last year, when the 27 lawmakers who were formerly members of uh, PDP defected to the House, to the APC, which ultimately meant by the construction of um, the Constitution, particularly um, Section 109, Subsection 1, Paragraph G, which states that where a member has been elected into the House of Assembly by a political party and defects from that sponsoring political party to another political party during um, that tenure, he vacates that office by reason of that defection, provided always that there is no division in the party and that there is no merger in the party and that there's no faction that merge with another political party, those provisos notwithstanding, that if a member defects from um, the House of Assembly, having been sponsored by another political party and defects to another political party, he ceases to be a member of that political party. So effectively, from October last year, when these 27 lawmakers defected from their sponsoring political party, the PDP, they ceased to become members of the House of Assembly of River State, meaning that if those 27 members have vacated their seats, the remainder now forms um, the new House of Assembly. And if you remember also that very last year, a new speaker emerged after that defection yeah. in the person of Edison Ehe. And he held forth until there was an intervention, in quotes, political intervention by the President of the Federal Republic of Nigeria, where he summoned all parties to Asuro and they reached a compromise, in quotes, where it was stated that the 27 lawmakers should remain as members of the House of Assembly and that the status quo should be maintained. The commissioners should go back to their, to their offices and then that all matters in court uh, should be withdrawn and so on and so forth. Now, that resolution that was passed at Asso Rock has become subject of several a plethora of litigation raging in several courts in the country, from River State here and as far as Abuja. Okay. This that issue has generated a lot of um, 
legal yeah. debates in the, in, the, in the law courts. Now, but what is imperative is that when Edison Ehe took over as the Speaker of the House, he declared constitutionally, he declared those seats vacant. And that declaration of the vacancies was also communicated to INEC, meaning that the process of conducting a by-election to fill those vacancies had been activated. So that is where things were up until now. Oh, all right. Where, um, now, uh, 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 talking about... Uh... Uh, you've actually explained quite a lot and, uh, you know, it's no gain saying that this crisis has actually dragged for quite a long time. But then uh, let's go back to uh, Governor Fubara's, you know, visit. Uh, can his visit or his unscheduled visit to the Assembly quarters be interpreted as an infringement upon the separation of powers doctrine, you know, given the independence of the legislative branch from the executive interference? He did not visit the plenary uninvited. He visited the assembly complex. Sorry, not the assembly complex, the quarters. The quarters built by taxpayers' money, which is superintended by the governor himself. So you cannot interpret that to be an infringement on anybody's uh, statutory rights. And don't also forget that these 27 lawmakers, in the eyes of the law, no longer exist as lawmakers. Mm. All right, and the governor. If you if you've listened to the governor in the past few days, he has started aligning himself with the with with the constitution instead of the political solutions, which is now being challenged in court. The governor himself is also respondent in most of those cases where others lawyers are praying that the court should restrain this governor from recognizing those twenty-seven lawmakers. So he himself. He has had lawyers represent him in court to state his own position on this issue. But I believe that he has started realizing that the Constitution is the supreme leg. It's of a course. supreme law from which even he himself derives his power as a governor. Of course. And if he decides to go back to the Constitution, he is in the right path. So he has been saying that he doesn't want to recognize those 27 lawmakers anymore. He's well within his power and he's... He's, okay, he's, talking uh, about talking order, about the governor's lawyer, powers still, um, uh, how do you think the recent political crisis, uh, not really recent, uh, but how do you think the crisis within the River State House of Assembly, you know, affects the state's governance and the rule of law, particularly in terms of, you know, legislative decision making and public confidence in the political system? Now, the Constitution also stated that no nobody who is not a member of the House of Assembly can participate in lawmaking process in the state. In fact, it's even it's even a criminal. It's even criminal. It's criminal. So, if anybody has been carrying on business as a legislator when he is not, that person is actually committing an offense for which he can be tried and actually imprisoned. Okay, that's that's uh, that's that's aside, but. We can say for sure that indeed, I have always been wondering how the governor has been faring all this while when we know that the House of Assembly he had been reckoning with was not actually a House of Assembly recognized in law. So the question is that their activities, their resolutions, their laws, the laws they've passed, are those laws binding? I'm also aware that some of those laws that were passed by those 27 lawmakers did not enjoy the assent of the governor. So what happens to those laws? I hear that they also overrode his veto. question is that do they have the power to even see, to even make laws, not to talk of overriding the veto of the governor. Now, you also are aware that some commissioners have left, and there's need to replace those commissioners. question I've always been asking, how is he going to appoint those commissioners without a... a a valid House of Assembly, okay? Because they have to, they ha he has to present the names for screening and so many activities of, of government that depends on the, uh, the functions of the legislature. How will the governor be able to carry on without a valid functional House of Assembly? So those questions are the questions that have been answered by the emergence of this new speaker who was just elected um, yesterday, a few hours ago. Now that we have a new speaker, we have three members of the House of Assembly to carry on legislative business for the states to help the governor to move this state forward. We believe that all will be settled in due course, politically. All right. 
Now, just before you know, uh, we let you go, Eugene. What role does uh, the legal principle of transparency, accountability, and due process play in ensuring the legitimacy and effectiveness of government actions and decisions? You know, especially in situations involving political tensions and institutional disputes. Now, any action that is outside the governing principle, which is the constitution, okay, will definitely definitely suffer um, the issue of um, legitimacy. Now, like I said, the constitution is the supreme lex, is the supreme law that binds and governs the activities of government and governance. Now, every activity of government that is outside the provisions of the constitution, it's not legitimate and cannot receive any constitutional backing. It will fall if tested um, through judicial process. So, and that's why I kept on saying that the governor should always hide himself under the provisions of the constitution and he will be protected. And any action taken by any member of the House of Assembly that's in line with the provisions of the constitution will be valid and will be protected at the end of the day. Now, there's an issue of quorum. Whether these three lawmakers can validly form a quorum to pilot the affairs of the legislature in River State? My answer is an emphatic yes. Because if you look at section 90, 96 of the Constitution, of, particularly subsection 1, it says that the quorum shall be one third of all, the, I'm emphasizing the word all in capital letters, all. It didn't say one third of 20 or one third of a specific number. It says one third of all. The question is that how many constitute all now in River State? The question, the answer is three. Now, as these three members have sat and decided to elect a speaker, Every action that they are taking here and after is recognized and valid and binding. Yes. All right. Uh, we seem to have lost uh, Eugene, but thank you so much uh, for joining us and speaking to us on that. Now, meanwhile, the newly elected Speaker of the Rivers House of Assembly, Victor Kojumbo, has called on the executive and the judiciary, as well as the public, to disregard every law enacted by the amaule led assembly now in his acceptance speech as the new speaker of the assembly he described the purported law as an exercise in futility the new speaker thanked the members for electing him sequel to the resignation of the former speaker edison ehe the emergence of okojombo came just 48 hours after governor fubara declared that the 27 members who defected from the PDP to the APC in 2023, were no longer recognized as legislators. He becomes the third speaker under the current administration after Edison Ehe and Martin Amaule. I want to thank you, distinguished honorable members, for electing me as the new speaker, pursuant to the resignation of Right Honorable Edison Ogrenye Ehe. All laws, plenary sections, and actions taken by the illegal house are hereby declared void and a nullity in the eyes of the law by virtue of the judgment of Lord Denning in the celebrated case of McFoy versus UAC 1961. Lord Denning held in that case that you cannot put something on nothing and expect it to stand. The executive arm, the judiciary, and the general public are hereby called upon to disregard every purported laws enacted by the illegal assembly as they all amount to nothing and they are exercised in future. Away from Rivers politics, Nigeria's House of Representatives has directed the Central Bank of Nigeria to halt the planned implementation of the cybercrime levy which the Apex Bank says is in line with provisions of the Nation's Cybersecurity Act. This followed the adoption of a motion of urgent national importance raised by the House Minority Leader and 359 other lawmakers saying that the Apex Bank's order to financial institutions and payment service providers creates an excuse for misinterpretation of the directive. The lawmakers expressed worry, saying that if actions are not taken to suspend the directive, the Apex Bank will be implementing the law in error. The House is further concerned that the words of the CBN Circular leaves 
the CBN directive to multiple interpretations, including that the levy be paid by bank customers, that is Nigerians, against the letter and spirit of Section 442A of the Act, which specified businesses that should be levied accordingly. The House is worried that this Act has led to apprehension as civil society organizations and citizens of the country have taken to conventional and social media to call out the federal government, give ultimatums for reversal of the imposed levy on Nigerians, amongst others. The House is therefore called upon to resolve to direct the Central Bank of Nigeria to withdraw the ambiguous circular and issue an unequivocal circular in line with the letters and spirit of the law. Those in support of this motion should say aye. aye. Those against should say nay. Aye. The ayes have it. A federal high court in Abuja, the capital of Nigeria, has granted 100 million Naira bail each to a former Minister of Aviation, Hadi Sirika, his first daughter, and two others. They are being tried over an alleged fraud in the tune of 2.7 billion Naira. According to the court, they are also to provide two shorties who must have landed properties in Abuja. The court also restricted the defendants from traveling abroad without its permission. The trial will commence on the 10th, 11th, and 20th of June. Counsel to the Economic and Financial Crimes Commission, Roti Mi Jacob, spoke on the bail conditions granted by the court. One of the two cases filed against the former minister. So the first one is taken before this, this lordship here. So we are going to contend for the other one in another date. So, but the bill is at the discretion of the court. So it's for the court to decide whether it is adequate or not. So a counsel in his own right cannot criticize the judge whether the, the conditions are liberal or high or low, but I think it is fair. Yes, thank you. Well, we, there, there are other, there are other um, um, issues that, are, that, that were introduced, like the, the Nigerian Airways um, with the Topia something, which we had to hit, so it was not there originally, but Nigerian Air matter is uh, there are two counts on it that's why we amended it the condition that one of the short team must own property in abuja and must um, deposit um, some some uh, money out or, or um, bond and all those things so it's, uh, it's i don't think it's a, it's a strenuous um, it's, it's a condition that is unfair it's very to discuss this further i'm being joined by a lawyer evans ufeli Hello, Evans. Thank you for joining us at this time. So, Evans, tell us, how significant is the role of intent in proving corruption charges in this case, particularly regarding Sirica's alleged fraudulent awarding of contracts to family members and associates? Well, uh, at the level of uh, prosecution, at the level of arraignment, everything still lies in the realm of allegation. Um, the charge preferred against him is to enable him um, take his plea, which he has done today. He has pleaded not guilty, and he has been granted bail according to law. But then the, the court will continue prosecution. The, the prosecution is ready, and the, the defense uh, appears to be ready for this case. So largely, the prosecution, which is the EFCC, will have to prove uh, the case beyond reasonable doubt, and that is the standard of law. Um, the allegations are quite... Um, Honorous. Um, it appears uh, the EFCC have uh, gathered evidence to this effect. So one will look at um, the process of proceedings and how this will go. Um, the primary offender, the secondary offenders, and uh, all that have been properly captured in the charge preferred against uh, the defendants. So uh, it is one that must be followed keenly so that we'll get to a conclusion of the matter to know who. I did watch when and how, and uh, how that uh, we have a Nigerian air uh, that uh, we could not understand exactly how uh, the processes went. See, it is trial that we reveal who did the wrong thing, uh, who should be punished according to law, and uh, generally those who will be brought to book by virtue of this uh, contractual engagement. All right. Now, in proving the case beyond any reasonable doubt, 
Are there any potential conflicts of interest that could impact the impartiality of the judge or the fairness of the trial, given that, you know, uh, given Sirica's previous position within the government? No, I don't think so. Uh, I don't think there's any, there's going to be impartiality or any condition or conflict of interest that will impede judgments. I mean, the judge in question have no relationship with uh, uh, Sirica. Uh, and the court itself is constituted to do justice dispassionately, to look at cases dispassionately. And uh, more importantly, Nigerians should watch, Nigerians should be vigilant uh, and follow up this case in such a way that we'll get to a logical conclusion. Uh, in the eyes of the law and from the standpoint of a bystander, there is nothing that is, um, in, that is, so, that is sought or obstructing or that would um, create a situation where uh, justice would not be seen here, except there are issues we don't know about. But as it, as it stands, as the case is constituted uh, uh, right now, there's a tendency that uh, the EFCC will do it best, uh, put in their best. The defendant is also, by Section 35 of the 1999 Constitution, have the constitutional safeguard of uh, being given adequate time of facility to prepare their, to prepare their defense. Okay, so okay. everything is within the ambit of law as we speak. Okay, so, um, so talking about it being within the ambit of the law, uh, Evans, what legal avenues are available to the defense if they believe that, you know, the bail conditions set by the court are unduly restrictive or disproportionate to the alleged offenses? Well, the legal remedy open to them is to bring a motion before the same court to ask for variation. And that um, if they have cogent reasons and they have a good um, um, evidence to show that perhaps the bail condition is one that is uh, out of reach, then the court will consider to vary the condition. That is what they have before the law. The, their lawyers know what to do. It so come before the same court with a motion. And that motion will be heard. A uh, motion on notice, which... Uh, the ESCC will put on notice of that effect. They may decide to file a counter affidavit also to argue uh, why the bail condition should remain the way it is. Uh, but the legal remedy is to bring a motion to ask the court to vary the bail condition on the basis that uh, it is stringent or it is uh, out of reach. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Evans, for uh, taking time out to speak to us. Thank you very much. I was with that, we'll take a quick break, and when we come back, the news continues. Stay with us. The concept of corruption has and is still being interpreted in several ways by several people. However, there is a unanimous agreement that if corruption is not addressed, it can be the downfall of any nation. This has formed the crux at a public lecture organized by the Commonwealth Institute of Advanced and Professional Studies. News Central's Bernard Akede was at the public lecture themed Anatomy of Corruption was discussed and he's, this is his report. Embezzlement, theft and lack of accountability amongst others have in recent times flooded the news in Nigeria, further amplifying the conversation around the increased level of corruption in the country. While several anti-graft agencies have been exposing individuals and organizations whom they feel may have crossed the corruption line, it may appear that just the surface has been scratched. This and other reasons necessitated this lecture. This is the time to reset in Nigeria our approach to something as vital as corruption. I think there is um, a limited understanding it, of it, um, a instrumental understanding, a partial understanding, and these understandings do not lead to proper solutions that does not lead us to find elements of fighting corruption. So if we go beyond the moral, judicial, persecution aspect of corruption and get a systemic look, hence we call it anatomy, dissect it very well, we are likely to get a better understanding. While so much has already been said about corruption, it appears that the concept has so evolved that identifying what is and what is not corruption sometimes can be mistaken. When we dis, uh, define corruption as any act of dishonesty, what we mean is that whatever you do that you don't want the law to be aware of is corruption. 
whether you do it to protect somebody else, which is called pseudo corruption, or you do it to enrich yourself, it is uh, major corruption, which is true corruption. But then, corruption is corruption. Over the years, the Nigerian government has put certain structures and institutions in place to fight corruption. However, the success of these institutions can largely be questioned. So when there is lack, the tendency for everybody to want to cut corners. And when it is not available, uh, you see yourself holding that, opposition, that position as a privilege. And that privilege you want to pander to certain persons. It now becomes about you. It now becomes about, uh, not about the process, not about the law, but about you and the people that put you there about that person who extended the privilege to you. And so, because you know if you do not pander, certainly you won't last long. Having identified a litany of corruption cases in the country, the inevitable question to ask is, can there be a solution in sight? Well, I think four things. It's not, not much. Number one is rule of law. Number two is certainty of actions. Number three is decentralization of authorities and power. And number four is a strong body of counterbalance, I think more of corporate Nigeria. I think I'm, I'm very worried about how weakness, how weak corporate Nigeria is in a whole system, and this leads to corruption as well. Clearly, the issue of corruption in Nigeria is not one that will be sorted in one day. But if there is to be any headway in addressing it, conversations like this cannot be overemphasized. In Lagos for New Central, I'm Bernard Akede. as a penalty for drug traffickers in the country as it passes through the third reading, the 2024 NDLEA Act Amendment Bill. The proposal was adopted on Thursday when the Senate dissolved into a committee of the whole for class-by-class -class consideration of a report of the chairman of the Committees on Judiciary, Human Rights and Legal Matters and Drugs and Narcotics National Drug Law Enforcement Agency, that's the NDLEA Act Amendment Bill 2024, Senator Tahir Munguno. In a review of the penalty provisions of the amendment bill towards strengthening the operations of the agency, a proposed amendment to award a death sentence to drug traffickers rather than just a life sentence was raised by the Senate Chief Whip and Senator Peter Nwebonyi under Class 11. The Southwest Tinubu Shatima Presidential Supporters Movement has threatened to expose those prominent members of the All Progressives Congress working against the success of the administration of the President Bola Tinubu. Now, uh, addressing a press conference in Lagos, the coordinator Southwest Tinubu Shatima Presidential Supporters Movement, Femi Bode Banjoko, Banjoko said rather than assist the president to improve on the country's security and economy, they were busy chasing their perceived political enemies all around the country while the country suffers. He noted that these party members have been using their positions as appointees of the president to pursue their personal agendas rather than concentrate on the assignment of their offices. Justifying the appointment, what, whatsoever but concentrating and alleating those who are working hard for the success of the party in the last presidential, uh, presidential election. For instance, the former governor of uh, El Rufai of Kaduna um, and Ganduje of Kano we are the forefront of the northern governor who gave hundreds of 100% 100 support and loyalty with tireless hard work and ensuring that Ashwaju victory to emerge as a party presidential candidate and eventually the presidential, uh, the president and commander-in-chief of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. At this point, Yaya Velo, too, also worked very hard for the country, for the presidential ambition to be fulfilled. He win, he win his state, he deliver his state at that point in time. Say this, it is a known fact to all of us that former Governor Yaya Bello put in all resources and everything to win the state for President Bola Amertinogo and some other people too are putting all they could do 
Now, I think we shouldn't pay all these people with evil or pay them back. Protesters in Abuja have demanded the release of Nigerian journalist Daniel Ojuku, accusing the Nigeria police force of infringing on his fundamental human rights. The protesters, you say his arrest seven days ago, and non-arraignment in court violates the nation's administration of Criminal Justice Act, accused the Nigerian police force of stifling press freedom. News Central's Joshua Imarai reports. It's been seven days since the Nigeria Police Force Intelligent Response Team arrested journalists working for the Foundation for Investigative Journalism, Daniel Ujuku, in Lagos. Despite his detention lasting over 48 hours, as stipulated by the Administration of Criminal Justice Act, he has not been taken to court. Pro-transparency organizations and demonstrators gathered at the Nigeria Police Force headquarters in Abuja to demand his immediate release. We believe that the unlawful arrest and detention of Daniel Ojuku is unconstitutional, it is not found within a democratic society, and it is against every principle, every rule of law in Nigeria. On May 1, Daniel Ojuku was unlawfully abducted by the Nigeria police in Lagos. He was taken to Panti. Three days after was when we found out that he was in Panti because he was rendered incommunicado. Daniel has produced a report which um, was done on the Open Gov um, Media um, Fellowship, which looks at basically 147 million, which was um, which was um, um, given to a contractor to build school in Lagos State. And when he investigated that um, that project, there, it was nowhere to be found. And the questions have been asked from the office of the senior advisor to the president on SDGs, who whose office led this project, and this is what has led to this process. They say his continued detention is a gross violation of his fundamental human rights and an attempt to suppress press freedom. It's not about Daniel Ojuku. They are after your jobs. They want to make sure that you cannot write what the police does not approve of. And your job as journalists is to expose the social lines on the government. Your jobs are guaranteed in the Nigerian constitution, the, the so-called 1999 constitution. Just as the police has a constitutional right to do what they are doing, journalists in Nigeria also have a constitutional right to write whatever they find necessary. Speaking during the protest, the Commissioner for Police, FCT Command, said the release will be escalated to the appropriate authorities. In Abuja for News Central, I am Joshua Imarai. The Nigerian Senate has approved the sum of 549.6 billion naira for the Nigerian Communications Commission for the 2024 fiscal year. This approval came following consideration of the report of the Senate Committee on Communications during plenary on Thursday. Chairman of the Communications Committee, Senator Bilbis Aliyu, while giving a breakdown of the Commission's total expenditure for the year 2024, said the 155 billion naira is for recurrent expenditure. Similarly, the Red Chamber approved the sum of 17 billion naira for the Universal Service Provision Fund for the 2024 fiscal year. The decided to approve the sum of 500, 549,674,311,000 thousand naira only as the Nigerian Communication Commission budget for the year 2024. Section 1 of the Nigerian Communication Commission are to promote widespread availability and usage of network services and application services throughout Nigeria and to all institutions. So in line with uh, the comments or contribution of Senator Ahmed Lawa, this is the agency that is saddled with that responsibility to do this. The sum of 549,674,311,000 billion million naira only has been approved as a budget estimate for the Nigerian Communications Commission for the year 2000. 
Residents of Agungi in the Lekki area of Lagos State are calling on the Lagos State Government to help put an end to the flooding problems that have bedeviled the community for almost two decades. According to the residents, once it rains, every human and business activity in the Axis is put on hold while they battle getting the filthy waters out of their prospective homes and stalls every year. New Central's Adesha Waudushoga was there and filed this report. The rains have barely started in Lagos, Nigeria, and one would not expect to hear cases of flooding just yet, as the weather is still predominantly hot. But the reverse is the case here. This land you see here is never dry. For the past 15 years, this has been the reality of residents, businesses, school students living in Agungi area of Lekki, Lagos State. Now they say that it doesn't matter whether it rains or not, this water remains there for as long as you can imagine. And sometimes it lasts for even one year until the next raining season. About 100 meters of the entire stretch of the road is often covered with dirty greenish water with a very awful smell, obviously unsafe for the skin, especially the feet of people walking in it. Anytime it rains, the rain doesn't necessarily need to be heavy, but you see that the water flows out from the drainages and it blocks the whole, everywhere is flooded. This road connects other communities like Ajiro and even other prominent and expensive estates like the Chevron Estate, among others. Some residents and even school children can be seen walking in the filthy water with no other option to connect to other parts of the street, risking a possible skin infection. When asked, they say they are left with no choice. It has been over 15 years and the kings know. There was a church member of mine that she normally walks inside the water. So I discovered yesterday she did not come to work. Part of her toes are cutting off. However, when it rains and the water becomes impossible to walk or drive through, students cannot go to school, businesses are shut down, and residents are stuck indoors until the water subsides. Although I don't like coming here, but if I get driven here, if you pay me money that I want, I will just manage to come. But if you don't pay me, in fact, I will even charge you so that you will not I said so that I will not come because I don't like coming to the place. Whenever uh, there is much, much rain, students from here don't come to school, except students coming from this side. Residents and businesses in Agungi are calling on the government, especially the Ministry of Environment, to find a lasting solution to these perennial challenges to make Agungi a convenient residence to live in and a better environment for businesses to thrive. In Lagos, for New Central, Adeshawa Udushoga. You're still watching New Central now. Coming up. Several injured after Boeing plane leaves runway in Senegal. We'll bring you details after the break. The news continues in West Africa, where a Boeing passenger plane came off the runway during takeoff in Senegal on Thursday, injuring 11 people and shutting down the international airport near the capital Dakar for almost 12 hours. The aircraft on an Air Senegal flight chartered by privately owned Trans Air was carrying 78 passengers and headed for the Malian capital, uh, capital Bamako. Now, the incident comes with Air Senegal having already endured months of criticism and passengers regularly complaining about delays to domestic and international flights. Thursday's incident came a day after a Boeing 767 FedEx cargo plane touched down at the Istanbul airport without its front landing gear, which failed to open, though nobody was hurt. We now head to southern Africa, where Zimbabwe ruling party ZANU-PF says it will 
or it's willing rather to help its counterpart South Africa's ruling party, the African National Congress ANC, to push for votes in the upcoming elections. Now speaking to the media, ZANU PF Secretary General Obert Mpofu said they have also been invited to be a part of observer missions during the election on the 29th of May. ZANU PF says it hopes the elections in South Africa will be conducted following SADC rules. South Africa will be going to polls on the 29th of May 2024. South African authorities, rescue workers and anxious relatives have said they retain hope that there will be survivors amongst or underneath the rubble of a collapsed building days after it came crashing down, killing at least eight people. Dozens of people are still unaccounted for more than 72 hours after rescue services started coming through the debris in the southern city of George. At least eight people were killed as an under-construction five-story building collapsed on Monday for reasons that are yet to be determined. Now, 29 of the 75 workers who were at the site where the incident occurred have been pulled out of the rubble alive. Six have life-threatening injuries and 16 are in critical condition. Not having communication with anybody else, we decided to, we must, what they call delay it work from the top down, um, that's the quickest way we can get to the bottom and therefore you need big machinery um, to start to break these concrete slabs and lift them. So there's also bigger machinery on their way from Cape Town, um, we contracted them in so they will arrive any minute now and that's to, to just speed up the operation. We will around about two o'clock go into a recovery mode, that's, that's international standard, but there will always be hope and we will work as if there's people that's alive so that we can be In other news from around the world, UK's Foreign Secretary David Cameron says the government does not have a supply of weapons to Israel, but added that the UK has a number of licenses for arms sales that make up less than 1% of Israel's total. The former Prime Minister added that the UK does not support a major operation in Rafah as it currently stands and will not until it can be sure that there is a very clear plan for how to protect people and save lives. Cameron also added that security was one of the UK's priorities. Defend itself and bring the hostages home. While innocent citizens in Gaza endure a crisis that will only worsen if aid cannot reach them safe. All this while there are at least 18 conflicts underway in Africa. This is a world more dangerous, more volatile, more confrontational <coughs> than most of us have ever known. And we need to face up to that fact and act accordingly. First, we need to make security our top priority. If you want a picture of the dangers of Milka, you can actually look right here at home in the last few months. Sir. Attacks on our democracy are called Chaita, including spying on the Electoral Commission and cyber targeting of our members of Parliament. Now in the world of sports, 2023 Wimbledon girls singles runner-up Nicola Bartikova has been provisionally suspended for doping by the International Tennis Integrity Agency, ITRA. The Czech 18-year-old who reached a career-high world singles ranking of 226 in April 2024 returned a positive test for trimetazidine in February and again in March after providing samples while competing at an ITF W50 event in Tnavra, Slovakia. Now, trimetazidine is a metabolic modulator sometimes used as heart medication. While provisionally suspended, Batankova is prohibited from playing in, coaching at, or attending any tennis event authorized or sanctioned by the members of the ITIA or any national association. President of the Ghana Football Association, Kurt Okraku, says the football governing body's biggest tribute to the lost souls in 
the May 9, 2001 football disaster at the Accra Sports Stadium is the continued reminder of the day. In a statement on the 23rd anniversary of the incident, Christian Black Wednesday, due to the demise of 127 football fans at the stadium during a Ghana Premier League match involving Hearts of Oak and Ashanti Kotoko. Okraku noted that the commemorative events serve as constant reminders that its continuing efforts to read Ghana football of hooliganism and make stadiums safe are the biggest tribute its government can pay to those who unfortunately died and those who were scarred by the events of May 9, 2021. Still talking sports, Ghana's black starlets are set to clash with their counterparts from uh, Niger in a friendly march on Thursday as they conclude their preparation for the upcoming Wafu Zone B Under-17 Championship. The game is scheduled to kick off at 3.30 p.m. Ghana time, 4.30 p.m. Nigerian time at the Accra Stadium. Now this friendly encounter marks the final preparatory fixture for the Black Starlets before the commencement of the Wafu Under-17 Championship on May 15, 2024. Under the guidance of coach Lerier, uh, Kingston, the team has been diligently training in anticipation of the tournament and aims to utilize the match against Niger to refine their strategies and tactics. And that's all at this hour. But before we go, here's another look at some of our top stories. We told you that House of Representatives halts implementation of cybersecurity levy. We also told you that former Nigeria's aviation minister, Hadi Sirika, granted bail over 2.5 billion naira fraud. Finally, you heard that 11 injured as Boeing planes kids off runway in Senegal. Send your eyewitness report to the WhatsApp number on the screen. Do you follow us on social media? We are at New Central TV. You can watch New Central live on DSTV channel 422. Star Times Channel 274, Avo TV, and YouTube. Many thanks for watching. I'm Darshan Usman.